Hey everybody, welcome back to Matrix Mash number five. We've been off for, that was 10, five. Um, we've been off for a couple weeks over the holidays and just, you know, with all sorts of personal nonsense and whatever going on, but Robert and I are, are back and we're excited to be with you in the new year. Robert, 2019, Happy New Year, welcome back. Happy New Year to you, Emily. I'm ready to mash it up. Let's mash this matrix. Mash this bitch, man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? So uh, what's, what's, what's on your agenda? What's caught, what's caught your attention? What's going on? Yeah, well, there's, there's you know, we just came through this, uh, this blood wolf moon. Oy. Yep. Is, you know, for some people, apparently for you, and I know some other folks, pretty intense moon. Mm-hmm. Right, we're talking very early degree of Leo. Now the uh, the eclipsed blood moon was no problem for Mr. Leo Tom Brady last night. And you know what was really interesting is that um, somebody I was texting with somebody. Is, is, they said Tom Brady. Tom, yeah, I, Tom Brady is perfect. Mm -hmm. He's perfect. I'm like, oh, okay, right. Like if you look at him, I mean, there's like hardly any flaws in the guy i mean of course he has flaws but you know the first thing that he does when he gets on tv after the game is he says hi to his wife and hi to his parents i mean tom brady you know he he's captain america mm -hmm. and of course he's great looking and you know he's always sort of rising to the occasion and it got me thinking about that conversation that you and i had about um about robots and sports. I was just gonna say, like, is he is he a, is he a football robot? Is he a clone? Uh, he's something. You know, it was I, so I was trying to 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 get into this story or you know or tell the story. It was a long time ago when Tom Brady first came into the league, mm -hmm. and the guy who was interviewing him, or woman, whoever it was, person who was interviewing, um, asked him, uh, "Can you define pressure?" And he's like, uh, uh, no, no, I, no, he tried. He tried to define pressure. <laughs> he was really struggling with defining pressure. It, and I'm thinking to myself, is this guy a moron? Because right, I really know all about Tom Brady. He's like, is he a moron? Or is he, does he just not understand the concept? Is it so foreign to him that he can't even define it? It was a really bizarre interview. And um, anyway, I just, I just, uh, I, I just thought to myself, we're seeing something that is so robotic mm -hmm. and, and so, I don't want to say scripted, mm -hmm. but, but about as close to scripted as you can get. Well, it, yeah, it's, it's, so, I mean, at this point, you know, so you and I have had conversations about MK ultra athletes and about, you know, genetically enhanced or engineered athletes. But at this point, like that may even be old paradigm. We may be actually looking at complete and total, um, you know, cyborg athletes or robotic athletes or cloned athletes that, that there, it isn't, there's, there's nobody home, right, right. at all. Yeah. And if you look, I mean, you know, so one of the people that I've talked about, I think both with you and also in a show I did with Sophia Smallstrom on this was, you know, I've talked about the gymnast Simone Biles, right, who... My position on her has softened a little bit in the last couple of years as she made her comeback because she has been, uh, there's been more of her, per, like she's been talking more, right? So for so many years, it was just like this gymnastics robot. And, you know, she's, it's been almost, I mean, it's unbelievable the kind of comeback she's made after a couple of years off and, it, you know, 20 years old and she's better than she used to be. And she has, you know, she fell a couple times at the world championships and still won by like five points and right. But like the, the, you're starting to see little chinks that say, okay, well maybe there is some slight human element to her. Right. But like mm. it, for so many years, it was just like, it looked like nothing affected her. I mean, I, an athlete, you've done sports, you know, like when you're nervous, you make mistakes. Right. And sure. People who work harder and have that mindset of being an athlete, they're better. They're better at that than, than most of us are. But like, when someone is just is constantly doing stuff like it's nothing like just, it's because they don't feel pressure they don't understand pressure and pressure is one of those things that like you know every human feels unless you're like you know far end psychopathic right and you don't don't feel anything or you're not human like you're cloned or you're, you know there, there's something or maybe you know autistic or something in some weird way but 
Yeah, no, I look at Tom Brady and the, the, he holds no appeal at all for me. I don't think he's good looking. I don't think he's interesting. He has no energy about him to me. He, to me, he looks like something that comes off of, you know, an assembly line to try and make, you know, the perfect, you know, cisgender, white, heterosexual Christian male or whatever, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm teasing. Sorry. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I feel that about a lot of, you know, I had some, I know somebody who was doing some work on a professional baseball player and she called him a baseball robot, right? Mm -hmm. Like she, you know, she was like, yeah, like, I don't, I'm just, she's like, I'm not sure this is human, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well, I you're out there. Well, clearly, I mean, just, just from a, like a strategic and statistical standpoint, uh, what they call metrics mm -hmm. uh, are, are base are infiltrating sports mm -hmm. at, at a pretty high level, um, especially baseball. Are you talking about using the computer statistics to make every decision, right? Right. Statistical yeah. analysis yeah. Has, has become this thing in baseball now where, like, for instance, with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Well, that's they, how they run their whole program, right? The Dodgers for the last several years? Yeah. Yeah. It's all, it's, it's all about metrics and mm -hmm. statistical analysis. And, and so Dave, Davey Lopes, who – not Davey Lopes. Um, Davey uh, – Dave Roberts. Dave Roberts, who's the manager, he has a fairly low salary mm -hmm. for, for a manager. And the reason he has a low salary is because the general manager basically has created – a a a metric script right they just need somebody who can execute what the computer tells them to do that's right and so so dave roberts is performing the role of of like um you know some somebody who's just kind of moving things around yeah you know, it's, it's like the machine is saying move this piece here it's like it's like the computer is playing chess chess but dave roberts is the hands of the computer yeah so he makes considerably less than most managers now there's, there's been a revolution in terms of metrics mm -hmm. uh, in baseball, and it's changing the game considerably. So first of all, um, if, you look, if you look at what they're looking for now with pitchers, mm -hmm. they're looking for pitchers who can throw a baseball upwards of 98 to 99 miles per hour. Velocity mm -hmm. is king now. Mm -hmm. okay? And the reason why velocity is king is because they've realized – that they don't want to have guys in the minor leagues hanging out for three, four, five years, um, learning how to pitch, learning all the nuances. You know, you draft a guy when you're 18, when he's 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, you know, you can't get him up to the big leagues until he's about 24, 25. And you've already used up a good portion of his arm by having them learn the nuances of throwing a splitter or change up or curve or all the other pitches that are actually required that you know how to pitch. And so what Major League Baseball has done is Major League Baseball now has kind of, you know, all these, all these uh, statistical analysis guys who come into the game, the numbers guys. So they're looking at, well, if we get a guy that can throw 98 miles per hour, all we really have to do is get him to throw one or two other pitches that maybe <laughs> we might have some command over so that we can get him up to the big leagues faster. Mm -hmm. Now, who fits the profile being able to throw a baseball 98 miles per hour, 99 miles per hour? I guarantee you it's not somebody who's 5 foot 10. Most no, it's, it's huge guys. Yeah. Big guys. So now what they're doing, and I've seen this at the youth level uh, because my son played baseball, is at the youth level now, uh, if you go to like a, like a, big, a big tournament in a place like uh, Georgia or Florida where they have these massive tournaments, 15, 16-year-old kids to play, the scouts will go and watch these kids play in these tournaments. Now, it used to be that scouts would go to high school games. High school games are almost irrelevant at this point mm -hmm. because these kids are playing on these really – and you know this, right, because you've been there with travel teams with gymnasts, and it's like mm -hmm. the best of the best, right? Yeah. So they're playing against the best of the best, and they get a better idea as to what they can do. And I looked at the rosters for these kids that are playing in these, these travel ball tournaments in places like Georgia and Florida, which are kind of the hotbed of, of yeah. action. On, on the pitching side, the kids go from 6'5 to about 6'6. Six, six. Mm -hmm. We're talking between 15 and, like, say, 16 years old. So those kids are playing two positions generally. They're usually hitting or they're pitching. So what baseball is doing now is they're, they're, it's almost as if 
the numbers game and the statistical analysis is, is kind of its own built-in eugenics program. So, so yeah, the same thing is happening in tennis. Like it, it has gotten to the point where you see these guys, there's a lot, there's a whole bunch of these guys that are six, five or bigger. Some, and, and the tallest one that I'm aware of is about seven feet tall. Right. But they don't have anything else to their game. They can't move. They don't hit a good backhand. Even half of their forehands, you know, are not under control. But they, when they, the angle that their serve will come in at will make it so that they will, you know, ace, you know, 30, 40, 50 times a match, right? They don't have to have much else. If, as long as they have a perfect serving day, they're taking the racket out of almost everyone's hand. There's a few guys on tour like your Roger, your Djokovic, your Rafa that can deal with that. But otherwise, most people can't. Right. So it's the same kind of thing. It's like it's becoming a one dimensional sport because of this, this thing with the, they're looking at angle, velocity and speed. Yeah. Right. Gone are the days of Harold Solomon. Harold mm -hmm. Solomon would never be a modern day tennis player. Right. Yeah. You know, who, remember, do you remember him at all? Harold Solomon? I, I, I don't. I, I don't. He know. was he was he was he was a scrappy little guy that was a great defensive tennis player and managed to hit most everything back. But he didn't have a big serve. And he and. Um, so he would play these very long matches and try to tire his opponents out. That was yeah. his, he was, he, you know, he was, he was a scrapper. I, mean, I mean, he's kind of like, I mean, obviously Rafael Nadal has amazing forehand and, and he has a lot of power to his game, but the way he mostly wins is by getting to guys' legs, by making them play such long rallies. So, you know, when he, when you have to play him in five sets, you have almost no chance unless you're an enormous server or he's got, uh, he's injured that day, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Same kind of deal. Same Djokovic to a certain, you know, there's, there's some of these guys that can do that. But yeah, there's, you know, these guys who had the crafty games of tennis that are, were very artful, right? That had every shot and whatever. Yeah, they can't, they, they can't, they, there's no, there's almost no space for people like that in the game anymore. So, so sports are becoming more roboticized mm -hmm. uh, with the inclusion of data, data points, uh, metrics, statistical analysis. It's even changed, like, what they're looking for now in hitters in baseball. Mm -hmm. like before, well, now there's always power hitters, right, that they hit the that's ball right. up. They that's hit, right. Like, yeah, the ang yeah. Uh, their angle of their swing is different, right? Like you it's have your the launch angle, right? So they're swinging up now because back in the day you were told, oh, don't swing up. You'll hit a pop fly. Mm -hmm. Or don't strike out. Statistically, a strikeout is not a bad thing. They've determined strikeouts are not bad, mm -hmm. especially if you're a power hitter. Mm -hmm. So it's changed. I mean – well, isn't it like I see? It seems like everybody's trying to hit like Giancarlo Stanton now, right? And Stanton not, or Aaron Judge. I mean, Aaron Judge. Right. I remember watching that not the World Series this year, but the year before when it was like the Expos in it or the Astros or the Astros, right? Astros, yeah. Astros. And I, I just the guy after guy after guy was just hitting these enormous home runs. Like I had just never seen such big home runs ever. They were just like going for everything every time. That's yeah, right. yeah. So now you have power. And the thing with power pitchers is that they don't last very long. Like a power pitcher, if he's throwing uh, 98, 99, 100 miles per hour consistently, I mean, that career is going to last maybe five, six years. Well, and also, do you remember back in the day when like baseball games would have, like they might use one relief pitcher, right? Now because of this metric stuff, they're also, sometimes their, their, their leadoff pitcher will only pitch four innings and they'll use 10, 10, uh, relief pitchers and some of them will come in to only pitch to one person right so this was popularized this last season by uh, the Tampa Bay Rays mm -hmm. and the Oakland A's because the Dodgers uh, have been doing it for a couple of years too and for, for those teams they do it because it's a budget thing like right. they can't theoretically afford big frontline pitchers so that's so we'll pitch this guy two innings, with, three with the innings. Dodgers, it's a different reason. The Dodgers' reason is they waste all their money on people who are injured all the time. So they end right. up having their super expensive pitchers on the bench and they have to, you know, glue a, glue, sew a quilt together with everyone else. But, yeah. Well, it's changing. What they're doing is also changing the economics of baseball. Yeah. And if you look at what's happened in this offseason, there's been a, an extreme lull in, you know, free agency activity like two of the most high-profile players, are still out on the market. Uh, Bryce Harper, excuse me, Manny Machado. And it's because teams see their salaries, no matter how good they are mm -hmm. or what kind of star power they bring to their team, they look at that salary and they say, well, for that salary, we could have X amount of players. Mm -hmm. And out of those X amount of players, we can fill X amount of positions. Yeah, And then from those positions, we can field 
a team. We can mix and match. So in some ways, it's quite smart. But there's also a real incentive to ownership to mm-hmm. have players that, you know, that are not going to fetch the same amount of money that they used to on the open market. The other thing, too, is that roughly now players after 34, 35, they're being phased out of the game. Yeah. Well, I, Bryce Harper's biggest problem is he needs to get rid of that beard. I don't know when you have a face that pretty. I don't know why you want to cover it with a beard. Uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't pay him the asking price either unless he was willing to shave. Maybe he should do a commercial for Gillette. Right? <laughs> right? Getting rid of his toxic masculinity because he's so pretty underneath, right? He's a good-looking so. guy. Bryce Harper's a good-looking dude. Yeah. Um, so you want to – is that a good uh, segue to Gillette? You want to talk Let's about Let's get that? into Gillette, dude. Okay. Like, what – you know, I, why don't you – I mean, I know you've been covering it a bit on the show. Like, you're much more on top of the details of the ad and the person who did it. So why don't you kind of – for the people who haven't seen your regular show or whatever, give us a little download on that. And then I'm going to have my rebuke to this idea that we're living in a world that is drowning in toxic, toxic masculinity. Cause I just don't believe that to be true. Right. So this is a, a bigger trend in uh, commercials in general. And uh, I talk a lot about commercials on my show because a lot of people don't watch TV, which is great. I mean, a lot of people watch my, my stuff or listen to my stuff. Um, they don't watch TV, so I, I get to fill them in. And um, so I've been talking about commercials for a while, and there's been this massive displacement uh, in the commercial world. Uh, I would say out of every 10 commercials, uh, the, the, the theme is going to be it's either going to be driven by a woman, and when I say driven, specifically for car commercials. Mm-hmm. driven by women because they're really going after um, or they're really approaching and, and, and doing their best to get women to purchase cars. Mm-hmm. I mean, the car is a symbol of liberation. Uh, and also in most households, it's the woman who controls the purse strings and the purchasing power. Mm-hmm. If, you know, if there's a couple in the family too, that's usually the woman. So you're generating a lot of the car commercials towards women. And some of them are very blatant. Some of them are less blatant. Uh, that's just one. Or you're going to see um, uh, couples that are mixed race now. This is really big. Mm-hmm. This is really big in commercials. And it's usually an African-American male and a Caucasian woman. Mm-hmm. All right. So it, it, it rarely, although you will see it every now and then, where that's reversed. Right. Um, so that's another, another really big theme. Another theme, and this has been going on for a while, is that the, the men or males in commercials are being depicted as weak, uh, effeminate, uh, kind of young, childish, puerile. And so there's this co- common theme that's been happening in commercials for a while now. Yeah. Uh, now, the, the sort of, the, I guess, the shot across the bow, the one that woke everybody up is this Gillette commercial, which is, um, well, you know, Gillette's, Gillette's theme in the past was, the best a man can, can be. Best can get. Can the best a man. Gillette, the best the, the best a man can, man get. can get. Yeah. Right. Well, now Gillette hired a woman by the name of Kim Gehrig. Is she an SJW? Oh, totally. She's a single yeah. mom. If, and if you look at her ad portfolio, let me, let me see if I can show you an image of one of Kim Gehrig's ads. Uh, this appeared in a, um, in a commercial, in a spread in a UK, I think it's a UK publication. Let me see if I can find this thing. Hold on, because it's actually, um, let's see. Uh, Hold on a second. It's a really telling uh, image. It gives you kind of a a background, or at least not even a background, but just kind of a real snapshot into her sort of political, provocative um, imagery. Give me one second. I should have um, popped this thing up. Excuse me. Here, hold on. Go on. Um, I also want to talk about. Okay, so here's this. Let me pop this up here. This is. Uh, <laughs> so some people might actually think that this is rather delicious, right? That this is uh, on, on a number of different levels, and I don't know what ad this was for. But um, let me pop this up here. But this gives you kind of a sense as to uh, Kim Gehrig's 
uh, sensibility and style. So there you go. Oy. Oh, here's what I'm looking for. Yeah, just take that in for a second. Okay. And here's, she did a commercial for something called Libresse, which I think is, if I'm not mistaken, it's a, um, it's either a female deodorant or it might be uh, a uh, vaginal douche. Let me, let me pop this up. My, my guess is that it's a vaginal douche if this is her style. <laughs> yeah, hold on a second. You got to see this. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Hold on. Let me see. Let's go. Here we go. Right here. Yeah. All right. Because this will really give you some insight. It, I mean, that, that first snapshot alone. Gross. Yeah, well, that'll, 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 here we go. Let's do this. Let's do shop share and let's do another share here. And here we go. This is for uh, Libras. Oh, Jesus. So, this is the woman who was uh, asked to do the Gillette commercial, right? They signed her up, and there's other images that, that kind of communicate what she's trying to communicate in this world. So she's, she's being provocative. That's her job. That's her role. Gillette has got a ton of press off this thing. And what it's done is it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's triggered, but I'll use the word trigger. It's really switched on a, a large debate about the role that advertising plays in terms of getting inside of us and programming, programming us, which it does all the time. Right. But this is almost, this is almost documentary. Like in some of the, some of the, some of the challenges or some of the, some of the things that people have, objected to with the it's almost like a mini film about it's about 90 90 seconds is the fact that almost every one of the men in that commercial happened to be the, that that appear to be toxic happen to be white right right and there's no other examples of quote-unquote toxic masculinity apparently there was a scene of a rapper that got cut out you know so he was black and you know he was maybe being misogynist or whatever, but it didn't make it. Right. And, and and there was the there's a there's a scene in there where there's an African American guy and he's like, you know, put pump in the brakes, you know, on a white dude, right? So not only are the majority of the toxic males white, but the males that are level headed tend to be non-white. So this has been some of the sort of the backlash around some of this, some of the, the material in that commercial. They set off a bunch of crazy memes, which have been really, in some ways, very, yeah. very funny. Um, now, I just real quick, I wanted to give you a little bit of a background on the guy that starred in Gillette. Okay. Do you know much about this guy at all? No. Okay. So Gillette was started by, his name is King C. Gillette. And he comes from a line of French Huguenots that, that went from France to England in the late 16th century. So Nathan Gillette, who was one of his um, ancestors, uh, moved from England to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Okay. And that was in 1630. And his name is King, King Camp Gillette. He was born in uh, Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. He was raised in Chicago. And his family, they, they uh, survived the Chicago fire. So they give you some, some context. So he's the guy that popularizes the two, the two bladed, the two sided safety razor. Right. Because he threw away a cork from a bottle. So he, it, so it, you know, it clicked something in his brain and he thought, well, you know, what if razor blades were disposable? He got into this whole idea of disposability. Right. right? So low prices, disposability, he had manufacturing facilities in the U.S., Canada, Britain, France, Germany. I mean, this guy was a razor blade baron. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, here's where it gets very interesting. He was known as a utopian socialist. Mm. And he wrote three books. The first book he wrote was in 1894. It was called Human Drift. Yeah. And, and the idea behind it is that all industry – should be taken over by a single corporation, which is owned by the public. 
So what do we have here? We have this, you know, this version of, of like almost Chinese based social Marxism right. or, or social capitalism. And then he said that everybody in the, in the United States should live in a giant city called Metropolis. Mm. And it would be powered by Niagara Falls. Okay? Right. He wrote a second book after that called World Corporation. Mm. And it was, it was a prospectus for a company set up to create his, this vision. And right. he, even, he even offered Theodore Roosevelt to be the president of this company that he wanted to create this massive corporation that ran everything, everybody's lives, right? He, he was going to pay Theodore Roosevelt a million bucks, and he declined it. And back then, a million dollars was a lot of money. Yeah. His last book was called The People's Corporation. Right. And that was written with Upton Sinclair. And um, he was also uh, initiated into York Wright Freemasonry. Of course. And he was, he was a grandmaster. So this guy's a grandmaster mason. He's a utopian socialist. And he's got this idea buried inside of this company about how the world should be. And I think they're executing on his vision. I was going to say, like, this is, she's creating this utopian, what we're, uh, this, uh, oh, if only women were in charge of everything, right? Then, then the world would be perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. So I have, so, you know, I don't know anything about this Kim Gehrig person, or whatever, but I'm really sick of this crap, right? Like, so we live, you know, we've been hearing this. I mean, the war on men has really been going on for at least, at least 10 years, right? It's been, very hot and apparent to me for five, but it's really been kicked up a notch in like the last two or three years. you know, about the same time that you saw the rise of like Jordan Peterson and some of these alt-right kinds of, you know, characters. Not, I'm not equating Jordan Peterson with the alt-right. Um, but, um, you know, I don't, this toxic masculinity thing to me just doesn't really hold any water. Sure. There are assholes. There are asshole men. There are asshole women. You know what I mean? But this thing to sort of blanket, all men or all white heterosexual straight you know right heterosexual cisgender men as being toxic i think is just to me it's the height of disgusting you know i am saying this as a person who was raised by a white heterosexual cisgender male my mother left right and i don't you know um i don't know what kim garrig would have to say about my mom my mom left and she didn't leave for like some of the reasons you know like she she you know my mom was very successful my mom made a lot more money than my dad did you know, and this is not meant to be a slam against my mom. My mom was a person with limited emotional capacity. And, you know, I accept her for who she is and she tried her best. And it was the best thing for her to leave her with, leave us with, you know, my dad. But my dad raised two little girls by himself in the 70s. That was not happening then, right? My dad used to, I had hair down to my ass. My dad used to brush my hair. He learned how to French braid it. You know what I mean? He, you know, would let me have... 15, 20 friends over to spend the night on the weekend. He would bake cookies for us. He would, you know, he did all the things that, you know, a mom was supposed to do. And my dad is not an effeminate man. I mean, my dad likes arts and culture. He likes opera and art and stuff like that. But my dad also, you know, he was a, you know, third stringer, but he was on the UCLA football team. And, you know, he's, he's a guy's guy in a lot of ways, right? But, you know, he gave up everything. You know, he made some huge mistakes. And I have lots of issues with my dad. But I love my dad, and he's been the person who's been there for me the most throughout my life. And, you know, he can be a jackass sometimes, but I wouldn't co consider anything that he does to be a sign of toxic masculinity and some sign that, you know, men are the pro what the problem in this world is, you know? Like, and, and aside from my father, like, most of my good friends for most of my life have been men, you among them. You know, m men have come through for me, uh, by and large, uh, way more way more than women have. It's only really been in the last couple of years that I've had, you know, meaningful relationships with other, you know, other females, right? So my experience of men, and I have lots of male friends, most of them are straight. I have some gay male friends and whatever, but you know, that is not sure. There's asshole men there, you know, like that, not, that's a, that's a separate issue, right? But I just mm -hmm. think this is, you know, a, this is gross. It's not helping. This is not helping anything. You're not actually going to create better women by you know denouncing men right it's just gonna be you know like the, it, 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 it's the same thing like the stuff with the race stuff right like you know like you don't have people who want equal you know these sjw's don't want equality they want a chance to be oppressor you know yeah i think that that's absolutely and these women don't sure could 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 men you know raise their game sure everybody could 
but instead of, you know, women could too. This is not what that is. This is saying, you know, this is women saying, we want to be boss, right? And so instead of us, you know, uh, you know, doing, you know, just be, you know, you're good at something, go be the best at it and then be boss in that. We live in a world where there's lots of powerful women. You don't have to, you know, trounce men or put them down or call them toxic in order to rise to your position in the world. Like these people who have this idea that we live in some sort of racist patriarchy is just the most nonsense thing to me in the world, right? Like the only thing that I've ever experienced any kind of oppression over is the fact that I'm a conspiracy theorist. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, we just don't live in that world. So, you know, I, people are going to do what they're going to do and she's entitled to her artistic expression and Gillette is entitled to ruin their company's name by doing this if that's what they want. But it just isn't true. You know, like I, I, I've been in this world for 43 years and that has just not been my experience of men at all. So I just want to say that. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that that's, um, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, when you drill down and really talk to most women and, and get, you know, personal and, and, and their experience, I would say by and large, it, it's not the same as yours. I mean, you know, they weren't raised by a father who did everything that he could because, you know, your other parent, your mom decided to leave the home, but their sense of fairness with men, which is, I think what you're really sharing here is um, it's there, right? I mean, there's more of a sense of fairness, I think, than kind of what's being sort of in a lot of ways, you know, uh, dominated by a small yet very, very vocal group of people. Mm -hmm. And, and I think this is where, where we're, we're kind of in the weeds a bit because um, I was, I was last week, I was talking about how Roku deplatformed, they, you know, Al- Alex Jones and InfoWars again, whatever you think of Alex Jones, by the way, Alex Jones and Jan Irving are having a bromance now. Really? Yes. And they're, they're, they're uniting over their spite and enmity around Joe Rogan because Joe Rogan, you know, you know, he screwed Jan Irving over because right. they were buds and he just jumped them live, which will Joe will do. Yeah. Joe, he'll do that. You know, he'll set you up and he'll just, He'll just jump you. Well, that's part of his job. Yeah. So, so apparently Alex is thinking about bringing Jan onto InfoWars, which is going to be an interesting. Well, Jan has been on InfoWars. That's actually no, how no, no, like, like as a permanent, like, oh, like an hour a day of Jan Irvin. Yeah. Right? Like that's, well, I, that actually, I, I can't remember if that was the first place I ever saw Jan Irvin or the second, but years ago, Alex had him on talking about the trivium and the quadrivium, which is really Jan's best work. Right. Yeah. And, you know, um, I, <laughs> I've said this before on, on Off Planet and whatever. Jan is genius level intelligence, but he is so paranoid and so like does this thing where just if, if anybody is ever questioning or critical of anything he says, then they must be an agent and they're out to get him and this, that, the other thing. No, the thing that happened, I don't know if what happened with him with Joe Rogan made him super paranoid and that's why he's like this. Because, yeah, the thing that happened with Joe Rogan was bullshit. Like, you know, but. Um, that is, you know, I mean, I guess it will, it'll be the smartest person that's on InfoWars if, if they bring Jan, Jan Rubin on, you know, mm-hmm. and he does have some true and interesting things to share. But at this point, everything is so about Jan being right and everybody else being wrong that he's a complete waste of time at this point, too. Which mm-hmm. pains me to say that because I've learned a lot of stuff from Jan Irving, <laughs> you know, you know right. Jan Irving. But um, that, that is super fascinating. Well, that. well, yeah. So, so Roku, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah. Roku, uh, Alex got onto Roku. Apparently he had been there and he kind of got, yeah, but he came back. He came back. And, um, so, so Roku apparently got some complaints mm-hmm. that, that Alex, uh, was, hateful, divisive. He's got the Sandy Hook thing going on. So they canceled him. They, they said, you know, they, you're gone. And it, in a lot of ways, it's very problematic because, you know, I have Roku. I wouldn't have had a problem with Alex being on there. And I know another, you know, you know other people wouldn't have had a product with Alex being on Roku. But it's like there's this gang there's like stalking seven people. Like most people either like Alex, hate Alex, or think he's ridiculous. But there's like these seven people that are obsessed with this idea that he's the one destroying the world and responsible for Trump being elected and all this kind of stuff. And they just want him, like, they, they would want him taken out and shot if they could have that, right? Right. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So, so, 
but you know what? This is the weirdest thing. I like since I almost forgot that Alex Jones even exists. Right. Right. Because he like, you know, for so many years, I mean, obviously no matter how smart you think you are at some point, Alex Jones is at least a tiny piece of your waking up process. Right. Because especially in the past, now he's just often complete, you know, neocon, you know, whatever, right wings, whatever territory. But for a long time, like he was saying shit that nobody else was saying that turned out to be true. Right. But it's amazing how like he's gone from, you know, like that. I don't even think about him anymore. Like when someone right. says Alex Jones, I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot. Like he, you, yeah, that used to dominate your YouTube feed because he put out so many videos a day, right? Mm-hmm. And now it's like I don't even remember that he was ever there. Yeah, it's like yeah. he was Mandela affected out of our lives. Well, I mean, if you bring up Sandy Hook, you know he'll he'll pop right to the top. Yeah, and and YouTube is scrubbing all their Sandy Hook videos. Right, but he he never even said anything that controversial about Sandy Hook. The people who, like the people who did the really good work on on Sandy Hook, like are you know, well, Sophia did some great stuff on that. Then you have like those independent media solidarity guys, and then if you want to get into some of the really weird stuff, you start go looking at you know uh, some of the stuff that like Professor Doom did. And all these people are gone too, right? You don't hear anything from them anymore either. But I mean. Alex Jones, the stuff that he said about Sandy Hook was actually really tame and didn't even begin to cover what actually went on at Sandy Hook. <laughs> right. Now, Jim Fesser wrote a book about Sandy Hook. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Wolfgang Halbig is, does a lot of stuff on it, too. Yeah. 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 So, so Fesser used to be everywhere. And now you, now you can't find him. I, well, he's obnoxious. He is obnoxious. obnoxious. But, but yeah. you know, he wrote a book on Sandy Hook. And he's being sued by the families of Sandy Hook. Unlike Alex Jones, he's fighting them. Yeah. Jones is just laid down. He's well, just that, laid down. That's what off. Jones is there to do. Yeah, he's there to lay down. Jones he did the same. He, he did the same thing when that guy came in from Comet Ping Pong Pizza. Yeah. Same thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was yeah. just like, come on, Alex, grow grow a pair, okay? You know, right. grow a pair when you need them. You know. Yeah, well, but that's what Alex is there for. Alex, Alex is like it's like what we were talking about before we came on. When I'm like at this point. With Serena Williams, are they mocking her? Are they mocking us, right? We were talking about her outfit. I'll show you guys for a shit and a giggle in a second what her outfit looks like at the Australian Open. But it's the same thing with Alex, right? Like, he's there, you know, for mockery purposes. And at this point, you know, he, he's used them, they've used him to mock people who, quote unquote, believed his things. And now they're just mocking him. And he's just that, he, that was what he was hired for. He made yeah. millions of dollars. He has a super fancy lifestyle. He's going to, you know, get retired and plastic surgery to some island whenever they're done with him, you know? And that's yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would agree. He's become a wicker man. He and Trump are becoming wicker men. Yeah. And, and the, so what's happened with Trump is that there's been such a uh, intense 24-7 campaign that's like right out of Goebbels with Trump. So what's happened is that there is a completely toxic aura around Trump. And if you're associated with Trump, it's got, it's, it's like past this tipping point, right? It's past this tipping point. And if you are associated with Trump, now you're associated, even if it's ideologically, even if you believe in some of the ideas that he might have, now you're in the toxic wash mm-hmm. and, and it, and it's toxic by ideological association. Mm-hmm. And, and when you get people like um, Cardi B being propped up as a social commentator on all things Trump and America, we're in big trouble. Sorry. Yeah. Just for the shit, the promised shits and giggles here, guys. This is Serena Williams' outfit for uh, the Australian Open. And I just, I mean, <laughs> really, look at this. The, well, okay, what's really troubling me is the, what looks like a concealed bulge cup. Right. Right down there. That, to me, is troubling. Like, what's going on behind that patch? Right. Well, then also just look like, over. Look, hold on. Go to six days ago. What's happened over on six days ago? Like, like it almost looks like it's being blurred out. Look at that. It's being blurred out. Also, like, like, like that. And then, but there's also just look at how big she is. Right. This is supposedly the finest female athlete that's ever lived. Right. You know, like she can play I'm, linebacker for the Patriots. Right. But look, just all, but look how much junk she's got going on in the trunk. Too. I'm not being critical of women's bodies. I'm not body shaming her. Right. But it's just one of these things that it's like, you know, like if I, if people, you know, she, that is, she doesn't actually have the body to wear an outfit like that. 
No, I think that I think this is a trolling outfit. They're totally, they're totally trolling every. But yeah. it's like they're they're trolling the public and her. They're mocking her at the same. They're humiliating her, which is part of the Masonic does ritual. Hum, does does look humiliating, totally. Right. They're they're humiliating her and they're mocking the shit out of the public. Just just go over to okay where your 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 cursor is. Go to your I think it's your left where it says six days ago. They right. all say six days ago. Okay, so okay, it's the one on the far side, not the one, not not the one with the three frames, but on the other side. Go over there, right here. Look at there. If you go, she has fishnet stockings on underneath it. That's crazy, right? Look at that. Those are fishnet stockings, and then this outfit here, and it's just and so she's got like you know this big you know white you know legs with a lot of junk like you know whatever i don't know how to say it she's almost got like a cod piece there or something right but then also that but then you go so she looks like this on the bottom like a big woman right it, uh, on her legs and then she's got questionable stuff going on here and then you go look at her upper body her arms and it's like those look like men's arms mm -hmm. yeah i mean she's she's ripped. i'm not body shaming i was a gymnast i've seen people with all these different kinds of bodies this is its whole this is off in a whole other world and this outfit <sighs> These outfits, she was just, you know, you know, wearing normal stuff and whatever that I would never say any of this kind of thing. But it's like this whole, like, look at me, look at me, look at me. Okay, we're looking, so don't complain if we criticize, you know? Um, so that was just for entertainment purpose. We don't need to get into the whole Serena Williams here thing. But it's the same thing. It's they're humiliating Alex Jones and mocking the public with him, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, well, my original point was, was that it was a minority of people who were making noise. Yeah. Around him being on Roku. And so what we're dealing with now is we're dealing with this kind of, you know, gang stalking mob mentality. Like what happened to Sargon of Akkad. Same thing. Absolutely. Same yeah. deal. Then this is dangerous territory. Absolutely mm -hmm. dangerous territory. Um, so gang stalking I, is no longer just for like, uh, you know, targeted individuals who are electronically yeah. harassed. Gang stalking is now how you get anything done politically. Period. End of story. That's, that's right. It's yeah. a vocal minority. And because the vocal minority is attached to, or attaching people to um, either being, like there's, there's these two guys uh, and they have a website called I Hate Metal or something like that. Mm -hmm. And their whole goal in life is to eliminate metal. And there is a- Metal uh, music or metal- Metal, like metal, metal music, right? Okay. Like heavy metal, yeah. death metal. They went after a label called Elegy Records. Mm -hmm. And yeah, whatever. I'm not a metal guy, but you know, some people like it. You can listen to whatever you want. Yeah. And, and so they went after this Elegy Records, claiming that their material was misogynist, it was hateful, it was uh, fascist. Okay. They went to PayPal, and PayPal deplatformed them, so they can't do any digital sales. Wow. Okay. Then, then Mastercard jumped in. And MasterCard deplatformed them. So essentially, this label was put out of business by, by a credit card. And once they were put out of business by a credit card company, once they were denied service by a credit card company, MasterCard and, and PayPal, nobody would touch them. So that's like the same thing that's basically happening over at Patreon, right? Like it, the, there's a big question is, is the problem Patreon, PayPal, or MasterCard? So we're dealing here with the situation of, this, you know, corporate fascism kind of thing, but, but, but being stoked by these obnoxious individuals who may also work for those corporations and may just be even posing as trolls to do this, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, on my daily show now, I'm getting people showing up in my chat room who are throwing out a lot of vitriol. Mm -hmm. And it's Cat like, lady. oh. <laughs> Cat lady. Well, I had somebody, I had Desert Wolf today. Oh, there's your wolf thing. <laughs> <laughs> Desert Desert Wolf was no, in my. No, there's a major wolf program running. That's for sure. What What did Desert Wolf have to say? Oh, you know, typical stuff. You know, got to kill all the Jews. And, oh God, know, shit like that. Right. So yeah, and uh, you know, and I, today I didn't take the bait. And I just said, you know, let's do your thing, get it out. And, and <laughs> I, just, I focused on the program at hand. Right. So um, <laughs> like I just these people who do this, it's like. I mean, I've never really been bothered. Like the first time I got an insulting comment, like I maybe hurt my feelings for a little bit, but I just kind of like, and the same goes with like the gang stalking stuff and right, the like, you know, 
Like these people are like, I'm doing what I want to do and they're spending all their time bothering me. If that's the height of what they want to do in life, does bother me or bother you? Like what a sad life, <laughs> whether they're doing it because they want to or because they're getting paid either way, they're like doing something stupid to fill their time. Right. <laughs> Just like, well, I mean, I mean, I think that they may be ideologically driven and that they're, they think that they're part of like a phalanx of, of, you know, foot soldiers that yeah, are there. Just go into all these chat rooms and obnoxiously yeah, say the same yeah, over and over yeah. again. They're actually going to change someone's mind. I, I don't think it's about changing people's minds <laughs> as, as much as it's uh, creating um, content like, or, or, or dialogue inside of a chat room that could be considered hateful or could be considered uh, insensitive, you know? So now I've, now I've got like, you know, you know, a track of crap going through my, my narratives or my, or my Twitter, my YouTube feed. So now, you know, if it happens every single day, Oh, look at the people he's attracting. Right. Right. So now I, I am, I could be guilty by association because these people are in my chat room. So now I've got a monitor in my chat and I've got a great chat room. I got people in my chat yeah. room show up every day. Yeah. You have a great chat room. You know, they hang out and it's like, you know, it's, it's been that when I was over on, on blog talk, it was the same way, you know, creating an environment that people like to hang out in and so but you know now it's now I'm, I'm getting some attention which i'm not really thrilled about that way so i just got to deal with it and see where this thing go, goes but we're staring down now yeah we're staring down economic censorship yeah which is uh, ultimately where this thing is going to going to be headed yeah there's not going to be any like a whole lot of real censorship Right. There's not going to be that. Everyone's like, you know, so they're always going to know the claim that it's not real censorship because you can say whatever you want. You just can't make any money doing it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so right. that's, that's be, right. That's going to be the new way. It's not going to be the censorship of old. It's going to be economic censorship. And you know who oh. the first person I ever heard say the term economic censorship was? Who's that? Julian Assange. Interesting. I'd never heard that term before. I heard he said it before any of this before when we hadn't yet figured out that this was how it was all going to go down right when we right. thought they were going to turn the internet off he was talking about economic censorship i had never heard it but before i just pulled it out of my head just a few minutes oh yeah ago. No. yeah so, i haven't heard it from a lot of people i've heard it from a few people in this past year but i'd know. say that i heard it from julian assange maybe five years ago and he yeah. was talking about it i was like oh that's an interesting idea and yeah. I think he's been, you know, he's, he's, he's actually turned out to be right about almost everything. I think what you want of him, but he has turned out to be right. And now if, whether he's turned out to be right because he knows because he's in on it or, you know, he really, you know, or maybe he was in on it and then he didn't like what was happening and he changed his mind and he went another way or whether, I, who knows what, the, what Julian Assange really is and if he even really is, right? Well, I'm not even sure he's in that embassy anymore, to be honest. With oh, yeah. No, I, yeah. I mean, so, I, okay. Um, I want to bring up one other thing, and I, before we move on from this Gillette thing, I think yeah. we kind of have already, but there's yeah. one other thing that was really an interesting connection, which I haven't quite figured out yet, is that the, the French word for the yellow vest movement is gelet jean. Oh. Right? So okay. the, the jean is... Was, what does that word do vibrationally? What does the word Gillette or gelet do vibrationally? What is the well, frequency of that term? Well, the meaning in, in French is a sleeveless shirt. That is a gilet. So it's uh -huh. basically the same word as gillette, right? Yeah. Very, very similar. Uh -huh. and, and Jean is yellow, right? It mm -hmm. means like Jean, like Jean does. U N E is Jean. Yeah, Jean. That's right. Right. Yeah. So what do we what do we like connect with yellow? The color yellow bees cowardice yeah cowardice like oh you know he's yellow yeah he's yellow so now we have gillette and yellow right so we have we have this kind of mixture cowardly of men cowardly men mm -hmm. Cow while this film has been launched it's a, it's an interesting connection and i'm not i don't know if many other people made the connection to the gillet jean and this gillette thing but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting sort of mash between the two. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, no, I, that, and that my, that's what my brain does. It connects things like that, that sometimes, you know, maybe there's something there, maybe there's not, maybe it's not there in the way people want proof that something's there, but energetically it's there, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you've infected me, Emily. Mm -hmm. 
I've got your mind virus now. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh -oh. All right. So do we want to move on to this uh, uh, Women's March MAGA thing, or, or what do we want to do? I think we have time for one more topic. Yeah, we can go Women's March MAGA. All right. Yeah. So there were two competing marches in Washington. There was the uh, Right to Life March, and then there was kind of a competing march, which was, you know, I guess an extension of kind of the pussy hat marches. And so they were, they were, they were kind of like not in the same space, but they were kind of in the same area, right? Right to life March sounds like that would be anti-abortion. What was That's it? right. That's anti-abortion. Yeah. Okay. But, but this, so there was another March going on too. So there was this other, other thing happening at the same time. It was like, you know, there's, there's a lot of sturm and drunk anyway. So there were yeah. these young guys from Covington high school in Kentucky and um weren't they, they just on a field trip at the lincoln memorial or something yeah and they were wearing MAGA hats right so there was a guy by the name of nathan phillips mm -hmm. who is this native american activist and he was there you know banging a drum mm -hmm. and the way that this kind of got spun very quickly was that you know he was sort of like the noble savage and the um the privileged white MAGA wearing racist punks from Kentucky were, you know, they were doing a number on this guy, staring him down and hassling him. And very early on, I was watching people's Twitter feeds and they were just going after these kids, you know, mm -hmm. white racist America. This is what Trump's producing on and on and on and on. And at the end of the day, you know, they, they had some other video footage of this event. And it was clear that that was not the story mm -hmm. and that the kids were actually practicing kind of remarkable restraint with this guy. Yeah. He was actually kind of getting in their face in the video. I, I, I saw Tim pool pull apart the whole thing. And it was actually exactly opposite of what they said. They were just there waiting for the bus to pick them up on the field trip. And he came up to them and was getting in their face and drumming in their face and trying to, you know, kind of egg them on to do something. Right. And they did nothing, they, you know. And one of them, I think, was even praying or something. I don't, I don't know what was going on. Yeah. But, but um, it's really indicative of what happens now uh, in the media. People will take just the, the slightest, slightest hint of a provocation mm -hmm. and want to spin it into a narrative mm -hmm. very quickly, even if there are other angles that show that that's really not the case. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is in some ways kind of a, you know, a relative of this internet gang stalking. It's the same kind of mentality. Well, I think this whole thing is that, like, so they would like everyone to believe that there's all of this racism, right? And I don't yeah. think there actually is. I think they're trying to create racism. Absolutely. And Danny, my friend Danny Katz, you know, and I, you know, we do the show together and we, we, we've been having trouble aligning our schedules. The next one we do, we're going to get into a little bit about this whole thing about how how dangerous what they're really doing is that they're actually going to create racists, right? Because after what you, it, the whole thing gets so exhausting that it's just like starts to become funny. Ha ha. Okay. I'm a racist. Right. And, and, and people start to like take this like weird little pleasure and delete and delight and glee in like, okay, well, if you're going to call me one, I'm going to be one. Right. Or I'm going to start. So, you know, people get tired of that. People get tired of being called something that they're not. And eventually, some of these people are either going to A, get worn down and become that, or they're just not going to care that you call them that. And they're going to stop, you know, like, you know, they're just going to sort of, um, it, it, it makes it so people then can't help but start to consider those things in their head, right? So I'm starting to think that this is about creating racism. Like, that's the, they, that they, can't, they can't find enough to get the political outcomes that they want so by gosh darn it they're going to figure out a way to go about and create racists right. and this is a great way to do it because now those kids they're 17 years old they're informative they're about to go off to college or whatever right you know and they have this branded on them because most people will never read the correction in the newspaper that corrects the story that they're right. racist well if they're not they may become them now because look what's happened to them right yeah yeah no i it's it you know it goes back it, back to the uh the situation at Duke with the lacrosse team. Yes, exactly. And there was such a rush to judgment uh -huh. with um, those players. Those, and those, those lives were ruined. Mm -hmm. I mean, they weren't really ruined, but in the short term, they were. Right? Yeah. I'm sure they'll rebound. And, but the amount of money 
that um, the parents had to spend mm -hmm. hiring lawyers to defend the names of those kids, right? I mean, it's like, yeah, we're, we're, we're you know, some of them D-bags. Yeah, probably, you know, and they hired a stripper. Yeah, that happened. It happens, right? Right, but the, but the stripper accepted the money and came to the house. <laughs> that's right. That's right. She did. It was a you know, fiduciary contract, right? Yeah. But, but what, what happened after the fact was damaging, and, and there was such a rush to judgment on this thing. And, you know, you would think that people would learn mm -hmm. from an event like that, but that's not the case at all because it's about controlling the narrative now. Doesn't matter if it's true. Right. Doesn't matter if it can be refuted. Mm -hmm. You get out fast enough, make the claim. It's a hit and run deal. It's the same the with this Trump thing. We're still sitting here two and a half years later and like we like <laughs> bring us the evidence already, right? But it yeah. doesn't matter at this point. They've just said the words Russia, collusion, Trump together in a sentence enough times now that it doesn't even ever actually matter whatever truth, whatever comes out doesn't actually matter. That idea has been fully programmed and, 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 you know, cemented in people's minds. So it's the same thing. And isn't this guy, isn't this Native American guy, Nathan Phillips, and that's a really super Native American kind of name, right? Uh, isn't he a, a, an actor or a DJ or, you know, some sort of, you know, on the, on the books uh, activist? Yeah, so apparently he was in a Skrillex video, which I have not seen, but mm -hmm. he's, he's in the video. So he's not just some guy who... No, he's a, he's, a fam he's a famous Native American. Yeah, and he's, he's, he's a paid activist. He's probably on somebody's payroll. He probably works for George Soros. He probably... Yeah, you right. know, or he's one of his you know, NGOs. Or Media Matters or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, he's, a da he's a downstream character, right? Yeah. So these people are employed and they go out and you know, they stir up shit. Or maybe this is all just a movie, right? This is all theater. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Theater. Yeah. So what's really interesting about that event is that it happened on the same weekend that the Patriots and the Chiefs played. Right. Okay, so you have the Patriots, who are symbolized by uh, the MAGA kids, right? Make America Great Again. They're Patriots. You know, they're white boys from Kentucky. They're from the South. And then here you have Nathan Phillips, who plays the role of the Chief or the Kansas City Chiefs. And it's all happened in the same weekend. You know, there's your... There's your synchro mesh matrix moment. Mm -hmm. It's been like that a bunch with sports the last several years, right? We've seen that sort of like Patriots and the Giants kind of thing, right? We've seen the, uh, uh, what, what have been some of the other ones? Um, and the other thing that happens is like when they have the, uh, uh, the team win the Super Bowl or the, the uh, World Series that just had like a false flag happen in their city that year, right? Like right. Kind of thing. Yeah, no, there is all of this symbolic kind of stuff, the Patriots and the Chiefs. And, um, you know, Tom Brady is that kind of guy that those kids from Covington High School would have been like, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right. And, uh, that's, well, yeah, I mean, Tom Brady went to Sarah High. So he came from a Catholic high school in uh, San Mateo, California. All right. It was the same high school that Barry Bonds went to, by the way. Hmm. Um, so do you know where the Patriots, the name of the Patriots Stadium was for, for a long time? What was it? Gillette. Stadium. Oh, okay. So we have another one of these matrix spitting out something. Something is like, you know, like the thing that I've brought up in the past with like the Harvey Weinstein Harvest Festival, uh, um, uh, Hurricane Harvey kind of thing all happening within weeks and how we had the uh, um, Hurricane Sandy and Sandy Hook and all that stuff happen. And you had, you know, you get these clumps. Yeah. And for, yeah. And I remember there was a period where it was all like, Neptune Poseidon symbolism. Right. So we're right. Ha we're, ha it. we're having something really around this Gillette thing right now. So the the matrix, the simulation is programmed to have something around the uh, Gillette, whether it be the next thing we'll find out something happens with Penn Gillette, right? Like so, right. Penn yeah. Gillette, you know, did some da dastardly deed, or Penn Gillette is right, whatever. Or he'll like disappear in one of his magic tricks or something, and that'll be a big story. So the the simulation the simulation is programmed to be going off with something you let and it's just sort of fritzing it out right now with that right that's yeah. fascinating though yeah 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 now mm -hmm. i think they just call foxborough now if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. uh, but they played in gillette stadium for quite a while but, uh, the only thing that would be better if it was wolfsboro <laughs> <Wolfsboro. laughs> then, then then we completely have closed the loop on this show right
Yeah, I, I'm I'm searching for a wolf sink, but I I can't find one right now. Yeah. So, okay. So we're at maximum nonsense as usual, and um, but yeah, that Patriot Chief thing. It's it, it, how how can this stuff all happen in one week? It always ha you know. Well, so what's also interesting is on the other side you had the Saints versus the Rams. Right. And the Rams are they're they're a pagan symbol. Mm-hmm. You know, Aries, Ram culture, when, you know, their it's, they're, it's association with slaughter and sacrifice, right? The slaughtering the Ram is a temple ritual. You know, it's all Old Testament stuff. And then the saints represent Christianity, mm -hmm. right? They, they come out of the Christian order. Yep. So on one side, you had the Christian order versus or this, this, this pagan symbol. Mm -hmm. and on the other side, you had the patriots. Mm -hmm. Versus the indigenous people. Yep. So very interesting how this has played out. Now we have the Patriots versus the pagan symbol. Yeah. That's, so this is going to be a fascinating Super Bowl. It's going to be in Atlanta. Right. Well, yeah. Which is um, technically speaking like the reincarnation of Atlantis. Sure. For the country, right? Yep. So uh, at Mercedes Benz Stadium in Atlanta. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Well, we get into some of this on our next mash. So we've flipped through a lot of uh, a lot of stuff here. Anything else you feel you need to get out, or I think we've kind of mashed up a good uh, a good mix here. No, I think I need to wear a hood next time, though. Yeah. That way, that way we could that we be like a, like a hood. We could have a hood gang or something, right? I, yeah. So and when people watch our videos, they could wear hoods. Yeah. And we could have like a thing. What do you think? Yeah. Why well, we could make some matrix mash hoods? That would be hoodies. That would be cute. Yeah, the MM. Yeah. Yeah. We could have, yeah, I'd like, I like that idea. We should make some Matrix Mash hoodies. Maybe we'll do that. That would be fun. Sounds great. I'm into I like it. Hoodies. All right. Okay, guys. Well, I'm, you, know, you can find me at offplanetradio.com, uh, my show with, for Off Planet Radio. And if you would like a health or lifestyle, uh, wellness lifestyle consultation, contact me on Facebook at Emily Moyer. If you want an astrological reading, you can find him at robertphoenix.com. We'll see you next time. Happy 2019. Out. Oh.